Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back, everybody. We're with my partner, John Coleman, and one of our favorite guests, Dr. Liz Lister. Dr. Liz, good to see you again. Uh, did you get a good sleep last night, Dr. Liz? Pretty good. Thank you for asking. It's so important. How about you? Now, uh, I actually got a pretty good sleep. Now, I sleep about five hours max uh, before I have to get up with the old prostate. Uh, but five hours is good for me. Well, I'm and jealous. I, I'm, I, every three hours I get up and I'm able to check whether or not the sun has come up. Uh, <laughs> but I, I get right back to sleep, but uh, never a whole night's sleep through like uh, I was when I was a young and Sleep is important. It really mm -hmm. is. I mean, whether you get it in small doses or can sleep through for 10 hours, it's pretty important stuff to our health, isn't it? Extremely important. The more we learn about what our brain does and what happens in our bodies while we sleep, oh my goodness, the more crucial and critically important it is that we get enough sleep and enough good quality sleep. Now, does quality sleep... Um, I guess I don't know what quality sleep is because sometimes I wake up and I don't feel rested and other times I feel just fine. Yeah, it's, it's really a challenge. I call a good, solid, all-night sleep the holy grail. Mm. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so I'm talking, <laughs> yeah, when I'm talking about that with my patients. But there's a lot that we can do, John, and that's what's important. We doctors refer to it as sleep hygiene. Hygiene. Okay. Hmm. I know. It sounds like a little bit of a funny word. We always think of hygiene as cleanliness. However, a broader cleanliness is one type of hygiene. When we use that in the medical world, we're talking about practices, things that people can do that are conducive to their health. All right. So we talk about sleep hygiene as a way of making sure that we're doing everything that we can. You know, I can give people hormone replenishment or natural supplements that are gonna help with sleep, but sleep hygiene is the part that my patients have to do on their own that, uh, that, that we all each have to do. So what, so what, instance, things, yeah, like what kind of things uh, uh, would you recommend uh, to help people in general they're not having some other issues, uh, get a better night's sleep. What are some good practices? Some good practices include the activities that we do as bedtime approaches. A lot of people are aware of getting our screen time to decrease or to change over into the more calming tones. A lot of people have their phone or their iPad devices will go to the softer tones as bedtime is approaching. That's one way. Another way that a lot of people are aware of is avoiding caffeine and for most people avoiding alcohol. That's kind of an interesting uh, one that has different impact on different people. But for most people, alcohol is disruptive to what we call sleep architecture. The stages that we go through during the night of sleep are usually for most people disrupted by alcohol or caffeine, not a hundred percent. And also for most people exercising strenuously is better to do that earlier in the day and not close to bedtime. I definitely personally experienced that at one point I was going to a gym where they had this very fun, very intense classes in the evenings. And it was very difficult to unwind and get to sleep until it was pretty late in the evening. That was not my best phase in terms of what time of day to go to do those types of exercises. Yeah, it sounds like what we really need to do is kind of prepare for sleep as exactly. opposed to wind ourselves up. Exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, and I like what you said about caffeine. I found years ago that um, even a, a, a tea a cup of tea in the evening was too much for me and it affected my sleep. So um, my coffee is limited to the mornings now. That's best. Most people really should do that. 
Also the timing of when to go to sleep. This is very interesting. A lot of us wear like a Fitbit or these types of personal devices. And I, mine tells me you should aim to go to bed between this time and this time at night, which, and, and sometimes it's hard to achieve. All right, so there's not very clear data of exactly what time one should go to bed, but it does seem that for most people, now you already said you sleep less than this, but for most people, seven hours of sleep at least is a kind of baseline, okay? And there are about 3% of people, and you might be among this 3%, John, that have a gene variation that allows them to do absolutely fine with less than that. So you hear about famous people who only sleep three or four hours a day. That's possible, but it's not most of us. Definitely it's not me, that's for sure. Okay, you well, know, I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna make it, John, no, I'm sorry. You, you brought this up at the beginning, so I'm gonna make it about me and solve my <laughs> problem, okay? Because your problems are good for us to solve, but... Um, I've always found throughout my life that I could have as much coffee as I want uh, and I would sleep a solid eight hours. It used to be I would sleep a solid eight hours. And if I had to be up in seven hours to catch a plane, I always woke up before the alarm. So I've mm. been blessed with that all my life. What I have found as I get older and my doctor says, so as long as you can still get up and pee, that's good. Uh, not being able to get up is not good. Um, but what I found, and I'll make this admission on, uh, in public, is that uh, when I lose weight, I tend to get more sleep than mm -hmm. when I put some pounds on. And my guess is that it's all the organs are pressing against each other and causing havoc down in that region. Uh, so does that make sense to you? Ed? Absolutely. It sure does. It sure does. And another phenomenon that's noted in people who are carrying extra weight is snoring. A lot of times snoring or obstructed sleep, sleep apnea often, often gets better. And most people report better sleep when they are at a healthier weight, not as doesn't have to be skinny, but at a, at a healthier weight for their body frame. This, so what you're describing is really, really common and very described in the medical literature. Dr. Liz, how do you feel about uh, sleep aids? I, I have a little bottle of melatonin. I rarely ever take it, but when I do, man, it puts me out. It doesn't make me tired, but when I take it, when I get to sleep, I end up having a really solid sleep. Beautiful. I, I love melatonin. There, there are several natural supplements that help with sleep. And if they work for an individual person, I am good with that. I much, much prefer those. The sleeping medications that a lot of doctors prescribe, well, first of all, sometimes they can be very essential tools because sleeping is absolutely more important and more essential to our health than if we're just not able to sleep. All right. But between the prescription sleep medications, which don't necessarily give real actual sleep and the natural supplements such as melatonin, I am personally a big fan of those types of items and I have no problem with it whatsoever. It definitely helps me as well. However, I tend to, if I take a full dose, even one milligram for me personally, it'll be too much the next day. So I always tell people to try these kinds of things out on a weekend night or at least a day where a nighttime where you don't have to be up the next day very early and having to perform such as at work. That's important. Well, you know, I found that uh, during this conversation, whereas John and I tend to nod off uh, with some of our guests, uh, you've riveted our attention. So I wonder if you could, for maybe some of our guests wake up uh, who may have nodded off, could you review the a couple of steps that you think are most important for people to pay attention to, uh, maybe to help them get a better night's sleep? Absolutely. Trying to get to bed at a consistent hour, sleeping at consistent hours, all right? So a consistent bedtime, even if it's the weekend, even if you're doing other things, try not to have too much variability between you when you go to sleep at night, uh, week, day to day during the week. That's number one trying to get at least seven hours. That's the 
minimum that most people need in terms of sleep for your brain to do all the cleanup activity that it's doing at night while we're sleeping, winding down as bedtime is approaching. And one more, here's a bonus for all of your listeners. That is what I call brain training for sleep. That is some type of signal that you give to yourself, you give to your brain that it is time to go to sleep. And I recommend that it not include electronics eventually. Sometimes people need to use one of the many sleep or calming meditation apps to help themselves train their brain to go to sleep. But ultimately, it'd be fantastic if you can do something that doesn't require an electronic device or anything with an on-off switch. Something like a poem that you say to yourself or a, a little short prayer that you say to yourself. I've had patients tell me that they will, in their minds, listen to a piece of music all the way through. And this is something that you can do yourself and you can train your brain. When I first started to do this about 15 years ago, it took a while to really kick in. But now with the little poem, the little prayer that I say to myself, I rarely get all the way through it. When I start to say it quietly to myself and I've done all the other unwinding, Oh, my brain says, okay, good night, and I'm out. Isn't the brain amazing? Mm-hmm. Is it that we could train ourselves Very. in that way? Yeah. Exactly. And what? sleep is so important. Well, what I'd like to offer is uh, that we, to our audience, and especially to you, John, um, because you're my foil, my favorite foil, uh, is that um, we thank Dr. Liz for this important information. And that we should all go home, uh, or tonight we should sleep on it and see how we feel about it in the morning. Amen. I love that. See ya. Love it. Thank you. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.